Nice to see you all. Chodesh Tov, Shavua Tov. It's great to start uh, my week with you, and uh, thanks to the SCA for putting this day of Torah together in, your, in honor of Yom Asfaut. And uh, the class, of course, is dedicated in memory of Stanley Chera. Alava Shalom, great community leader and person. The class today is entitled, Let's Get Physical, Returning to Land, Returning to Life. Let's Get Physical was a song by Olivia and John in the 80s. And it had some innuendos. I mean, it wasn't just innuendos, it was pretty physical, pretty actually sexual innuendos. And I'm going to speak about Eretz Israel, the return to Eretz Israel, returning to life in these ways, in a very physical, even in a sense, uh, uh, in a sexual way. And I'm not the first one to do it. This is already spoken about in the Nevi'im, and that's what we'll get to today. Before I begin, as a preface, I want to make sure that you know, and many people who have learned with me in the past know this, I don't believe that every Jew needs to make Aliyah. I've given classes on this before, and I believe that there is a need for Jews all over the world, and that's for another time. I don't believe every Jew needs to make Aliyah, on the one hand, but I believe that we cannot achieve Judaism's purpose without a physical state. And Rabbi, that is, Rabbi, hold yes. on, sorry. There's a link that the SCA sent out that might be different than the link that you sent out. Okay. Uh, I, I joined I joined with their link and there's nobody in that classroom. <laughs> so uh, Samantha, I, Samantha Shabbat is uh, in charge of this, so she will uh, check I'm this. I'm joined with yeah. the SCA link and it's fine. Okay, fine. So maybe I clicked the wrong thing. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. Yeah, same here. I'm fine. Okay. So, although I don't believe every Jew has to make Aliyah, I believe that Judaism's purpose cannot be achieved without a state. And that only with the state can we achieve Judaism's purpose. Judaism without a state is something less than Judaism. And will I go as far as the Ramban? The Ramban who says that all the mitzvot, this is, a cra- this is like an unbelievable Ramban. By the way, the Ramban is one of the Rishonim that made Aliyah at the end of his life. That all the mitzvot that we keep in Chutzlaretz are only practice, only a dress rehearsal for when we keep them in Eretz Israel. So to that degree that the, the mitzvot kept in Chutzlaretz are, are just in preparation, so we keep in practice. That's according to the Ramban. Most don't hold like this, but the Ramban did. So we can only be the model society for the world, to bring the world, to make the world good, to show the world how to do it, if we have a, a society that's run, that's run Jewishly, and run in every aspect of its life through the Torah and through Judaism's uh, Halakha as it develops throughout the generations. So that is the premise that I like to start with. Even within synagogues, even within big congregations and, and kehilot like we have in the United States and in other places, it's still only private in the sense that the congregation is not responsible for all aspects of our life. The state is, and you can't have two states running in the same country. You can have, you can have uh, a congregation with its own bylaws, but ultimately the, the whole state is contro- controlled or the city, controlled by whatever municipality or whatever, however it's done. So only in, with the state itself can you have a real, in a real sense Judaism's purpose. And that's what, so the return to the land, return to the land of Israel is a return to physical life in all its physicality, it's a return to the state, and we kept the spirit alive through the Galut. But that is the spirit which eventually brought us back to the land of Israel, but it's not enough to say that we've kept Judaism alive. Judaism without the state is a Galut Judaism by its very nature, by its very fact that it's limited to a certain small area of life 
called religion. Judaism was not meant to be a religion. It's, it gets spiritualized in Chutz Laaretz because we don't have to do everything that a state has to do. And the idea that, uh, you know, there's approaches, religious approaches to the physical. And there's the approach that, uh, that Christianity has that says we reject the physical and try to bring, bring us out of the physical. Uh, Augustine's king, uh, king, the city of God, is uh, removed from this world. Uh, a Torah approach is one that takes the physical and raises it. That Onik Shabbat, the holiest day of the week, uh, is understood as a, in a very purely physical sense. Not, it's not just about reading the Torah, not just about learning classes and, and, uh, and praying, but it's about actually uh, physically enjoying the Shabbat through, through, the, through uh, meals, through good drink, and through physical enjoyment. So we don't speak about uh, rejecting the physical, rather about making the physical holy, about raising the physical, raising the physical world. And that is the, the idea of, of uh, Torah, and it's the idea of having a state as well, that we get to bring the, the existence of this world as a community, as a country, as a nation, up to a higher level. So uh, the song, Let's Get Physical, uh, by uh, in the 80s was a very, very sexual song, we could say. And uh, I mean to say that when we, the return to the land is return to the physicality of what it means to be a living, live people responsible for its own direction and for its own Things and actually, now the, the, the pasuk I'm going to quote next is an unbelievable pasuk, and it's a pasuk that is not so easily translatable. And I'm going to share the uh, to share this section in Yeshayahu. For those who have a Tanakh available, you could use it. You could look at Yeshayahu 62, three. Uh, I'm going to share my screen with you. Hold on. Let's see. It just worked. What's that? It just worked when you shared it just now. Oh, it but worked. Then you unshared. Hold on. Okay. So now, Yeshayahu 62, uh, 5, and starting from 62, 3, it speaks about Hashem saying he's not going to be silent about Sion. Uh, and I'm skipping a little bit. Uh, they will not say about you that you've been abandoned, and they will not say about your land that is barren. They'll call the land Chivtziba, my desire is in you. Ul Arzech Beula. And to your land they will call it Beula. Now, the word Beula is translated usually as espoused, but it really has a much more sexual understanding. It really means. Uh, Be'ula, someone that has had intercourse with a woman. So now, Ki hafetz Adonai bach v'arzech tiba'el. Because God wants you, the land, and he, he will have sex with the land. V'arzech tiba'el. So now, uh, the idea, some, some uh, understand the, the, the idea of the Avodah as Baal as being rain and having to do with the rain fertilizing the land. But look how Torah takes it. Look how Yeshayahu the Navi takes it. Ki v'al b'chur betula yivaluch manaych. As a young man has relations with a virgin, that's how your children will have relations with you. And just like 
uh, Hatan has joy with the Kala, a groom and bride, Yasis Alaich Elohaich. That's how Hashem will have, will be happy and enjoy you. We're talking about the land that will once again have its children within it and become physical with the land. The, ch- the children come into the land, and that is a, a turning the land into a, 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 a conservation, so if you will, of the marriage. And a marriage you know, that's not really consummated is not really a marriage. Uh, the difference between having a physical relationship and a spiritual relationship is like, uh, you know, one might say like having a class on Zoom or having, uh, or having a real class. Uh, it, could, it could be the difference between having a relationship that's only a virtual relationship or actually meeting a person or having a platonic relationship versus getting married. So we have the the opportunity what we you know is celebrating in Yomat Smurut, the the fact that we're celebrating is celebrating the the turn of a of if you will just a spiritual platonic relationship into the chance of a physical actual relationship with Eretz Israel and consequently the opportunity to reach our purpose as Jew, as Yahadut which is only achievable with the state, uh, with having a Jewish state. <clears throat> I'm not to say that we're there yet, but we are, this is the, uh, the, the requirement, the precondition to achieving the purpose. Now, Yeshayahu uh, was speaking many years ago, obviously, and uh, people who saw the more current coming back to the land also spoke about it in such ways. And we see one of the, one of the uh, great thinkers and rabbis of the return to Edith Israel in the modern Zionist period in the, 19th century, in the late 19th, early 20th century was <coughs> Avraham Yitzhak HaKohen Cook, the first Ashkenazi chief, chief rabbi of Edith Israel. And he has, he speaks very much about this issue. And I want to quote just one or two places where he speaks about it. And that is from <coughs> Orot. In Orot, uh, page 80, uh, page 80, chapter 33. He speaks about the coming back to the land in a very physical way, almost as if a person is getting their, their physical strength and muscles back. <clears throat> Our physical requirements. We need, we, we demand our physical requirements. <laughs> we need a healthy body. <laughs> In Chutzlaretz, that, we worked a lot on spirituality. <laughs> We forgot the holiness of the body. We have ignored health and physical strength. We forgot that we had holy flesh. Not any less for the fact that we have holy spirit. We have abandoned, we have left the, the, the practical life. And the clarification of the senses. Because of low and fallen fear. Because of the lack of the belief in the holiness of the land. Uh, <clears throat> all our hopes and will only be achieved with all its spirituality when we also have the as- physical aspect. Basar bari, healthy flesh. Gufim chatuvim ve'etanim. Sculpted bodies 
רוח לוהט זורח רגיש לי חזקים, חזקים. A spirit that is, that is burning, shining of, over strong muscles. ובגבולת הבשר, המקודש תאיל הנשמה שנתחלשה. And with the strengthening of the body, the spirit will also be strengthened. זכר לתחיית המתים הגופנית. Similar to תחיית, the physical תחיית המתים. So, What Rav Kook is saying over here is that we cannot have a spiritual regen- rejuvenation without the physical rejuvenation. We cannot have a, a passion, an enthusiasm about Judaism without having the physical substrate in which to grow it. In fact, what he is alluding to, and he says it clearly in other places, but I won't go into it now, what he's alluding to it actually is that there will be a new kind of Torah, an Israel kind of Torah that has to come forward, that even in the Talmud Bavli, which most of our halakha is based upon, is still a Talmud of the Galut, is still a Talmud that was developed in Chutz Laaretz. Now this, is, this sounds very wild, and this sounds like a very, a very reforming kind of statement. However, I cannot only do more than base myself on the Midrashim and on the statements of the Nevi'im that point to this direction. And as difficult as it is to hear for those who like to say everything is good the way we have it, we have to be aware that that is, I believe, in my opinion, uh, uh, changing what was originally intended. And I'll show you the things about which I say. And this is, this is very... You know, this is uh, stuff that you won't hear a lot of times, but it is something that is spoken about here in Eretz Yisrael a lot, and especially in the circles within which I travel. So what I'm going to read to you now is, uh, is a statement from the Midrash Rabbah, Vayikra Rabbah, and we'll take it back to also to Yirmiyahu. Uh, let's look at uh, Vayikra Rabbah. Amara Biavin Bar Kahana, let me share it with you. Amara Biavin Bar Kahana. Amara Kadosh Paruku. Torah mi iti tetse. Chidush Torah mi iti tetse. A new Torah will come out from me. So what, what the Vaikranaba is saying that there'll be a new kind of Torah. Now, lest we think that the new kind of Torah is going to be something that is, uh, you know, a chidush, a, a small uh, devar Torah that someone says, or uh, what we're actually seeing is actually a new kind of Torah. The Midrash Rabbah continues over there, and it's, it explores the idea of what this new Torah would be. And it speaks about it in... in ways that are uh, uh, very, very physical. Uh, uh, let me just pull out the Midrash over here. Rabbi Barachia b'shem Rabbi Yitzchak. Ariston gadol atid ha-kadosh baruchu la'asot le'avadav. צדיקים לעתיד לבוא, וכל מי שלא אכל נבלות וטרפות בעולם הזה, זוכה לאכול בעולם הבא. What uh, Rabbi Yitzchak is saying in the name of Rabbi Ariston, hold up one second please. So the Rabbi Yitzchak is saying with the Rabbi Aristotle that, the, that uh, sorry, the Rabbi Barachia is saying with the Rabbi Yitzchak is that Hashem will make a great feast in the future uh, to do for his servants, the tzaddikim, that anyone who did not eat nevelot et trefot, unkosher food, ba'olam hazer, uh, will merit to eat them in the olam haba. Uh, and then uh, he brings Pesukim to prove that. 
and <clears throat> that you, when you refrain from eating in this world, you'll be, eat, be able to eat in the next world. So with the, in the, in the coming world, in the Atid Lavo, that's in the Midrash Rabbah. So now, the, this is uh, this idea that the Torah will be, in effect, changed to such a degree from kosher food being only allowed to everything being allowed. I'm not saying that that's the change that's most necessary at this point in time. I'm not saying that that is what, uh, what's going to happen necessarily. But to that degree of, of change we're talking about. But there's even a greater degree of change. And that is the degree of change that Yidmiyahu speaks about uh, when he speaks about the future, the future time, where he says in chapter 31, uh, <coughs> where he speaks about the new covenant, and that new covenant, that new covenant will be different. And it's, a, it's an important chapter to read in Sefer Yirmiyahu, a chapter that uh, may be the only very positive chapter in Sefer Yirmiyahu. Uh, we're going to come back to this pasuk and the way Rav Kook understands it in a second. So, new days will be, and I'll bring forth in Israel, Bet Yehuda, Zera Adam, seed of men and seed of animals. And just like I, I was very careful to destroy utterly and utterly break down, that's how I will, will be diligent upon you to build and to plant. For those who have learned Sefer Yidmiyahu, the reference to Yidmiyahu's first prophecy is very, very clear. Okay, we're going to skip a little bit. Uh, they won't, people won't say that we're suffering the sins of the fathers. Skipping that a little bit. And I'm going to make, to cut a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, a new covenant. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers. When I held their hands, I'm not like the first covenant that was annulled, that the fathers uh, broke the contract, broke the covenant, broke the treaty. And I had chosen them and I had betrothed them. This is the covenant. After those days, I'm going to put my Torah, my teaching, in, in their midst, inside them. It'll be written on their minds and hearts. And I will be for them a God, and they will be for me a nation. And it won't be necessary any longer for a person to teach another person, saying, this is how to know God. Everyone will know me. From the small, from the youngest, or from the from the lowliest to the greatest, uh, what because I will forgive their sins, and I will not remember their iniquities any longer. What Yirmiyahu is describing here is a time where God's teaching and God's way will be so natural that no one will have to teach anyone else what it means to be to be godlike, to be good. People will just know what that means. This is a very, very great change from the way we perceive of Torah in our times. 
this is a, ch a change that you might say uh, will do away with all rabbis. I mean, uh, you know, I'll be out of a job then, but I'm out of a job now anyway. Hold on one second, I have all the kids over here. Sorry, okay. Uh, so we're talking about such a tremendous change about what it is to be, well, how we perceive Judaism now and how it will be in the future such, to such a degree that this will be in every, written in everyone's hearts how to be good, how to do what God wants. It's like we should ask ourselves the question in all situations, what does God want from us now? And it comes through us learning, it comes through us being connected, but the f in the future, it'll be very different. Now, we'll, as I said before, we'll have to have like new laws, and we'll have, because we've been out of practice about what it means to run a country. And the 72 years that we've had a country, uh, you know, we're, we're still at work, very much a work in progress. Very much, uh, for those of us who live in Israel now, uh, we know we just had three elections in the course of a year. And those three elections are, uh, you know, we, we don't even know how the government should work together and if it's going to work. So we're still very much in the sense of, in the sense of, uh, of a work in progress. But we can only do this work in progress having a state. What eventually the form of government that we'll have in the time of the Mashiach will be something that comes out of the work that we're doing now. Uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, in his book on education called Emile, has a very interesting, it's a very interesting book, I don't agree with everything in it, but he, uh, he speaks about what it is and how it is to be, uh, you know, to be, he speaks about how, we don't, he says we don't really know the ideas of the Jews for the following reasons. Uh, hold on a second, I'm trying to share, and it's not allowing me, hold on. Okay, uh, it's not allowing me to share, for, oh, for, oh, here we go, okay. Uh, <clears throat> this is a quote from the Meal, the fourth book. Uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, 19th century, uh, uh, French uh, uh, social contract philosopher it says he speaks about con uh, contact with uh, with Jews in his time. Uh, those amongst us who have the opportunity of talking with Jews are a little better off. Though these unhappy people feel that they are in our power, the tyranny they have suffered makes them timid. They know that Christian charity thinks nothing of injustice and cruelty. Will they dare to run the risk of an outcry against blasphemy? And so on. Uh, <clears throat> he says at the end, I do not think I have heard the arguments of the Jews as to why they should, ha should not have a free state, schools and universities, where they can speak and argue without danger. That alone can we know what they have to say. We can, so what Emile is saying, what Rousseau actually is saying, is that until we have our own physical state, where we don't have to look over our shoulders in order to, to say what we need to say, and until we have in our own ability to define and design the state that we need and we want, uh, we'll be able to really know what Judaism is like. And that way, we can only really fulfill our goal as a people. Our goal as a people is not to pray only or to put on tefillin only or to eat kosher only. That's turning Judaism into a religion. Our goal is to make a country that is a model of what it is to be one that is imbued with justice, 
to be to be suffused with holiness and live our daily life and our worldly physical life in God's presence. That is the ultimate goal of Judith, to be a good example for the for the whole world. Rabbi Sasura Lava Shalom was of the opinion that we were given this particular location that is on the on the border of three great continents of of Asia, Europe and Africa, Asia and Europe, Asia and Africa directly, and Europe by sea, so that it would be a focal point, sort of like a showcase of what it is to be a model of society. Uh, we are 72 years old as a, as a Jewish state, beset upon by wars and difficulties that are, that you could only really know by living here. And I have to say that in the last years that I've been here, I've been here about uh, 20, 28 years now, uh, 1993, about 28 years. There are some experiences that you can read about and even be very connected through it while living at Chutzlaritz. But there are others that you could only have here, that you could only have here. When I saw my son being enlisted into the army, going with him to the to the uh, vacuum, where the place where the enlistment office were, with hundreds of other yeshiva kids, they were all dancing, and with their rabbis, each one was given a tzitzit by in, in khaki unit color by their rabbis, and the, the joy, and they were all so happy to be able to do this mitzvah of being able, being able to, to, uh, to serve the country, to do the mitzvah of defending Eretz Israel. The religious soldier, the soldier that has, in the one hand, on the one hand, they sing the exalting phrases of God in the one, at the same time of holding the sword in the other. Uh, my son, uh, David, throughout his stay in the army, he did daf yomi. That, and he was in a combat unit up early in the morning. We did the siyum. He finished the army in April. He did the siyum last in January with the, with the whole... This is something that those of you who that live in Israel and have religious boys serving in the army know what it's like. On the, on the hard side, Yom HaZikaron and Yom HaTzot are things that, that are, are experienced in it. When you experience them in Israel, it has a different nature. It's, Yom HaZikaron is, is not just like Memorial Day in America where you know, most people just uh, are there for, you know, for the sales or whatever. No, I guess not now Corona time, but, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a day where people go, everyone, I mean, uh, not Kohani, but many people go visit cemeteries to see the fallen, the, the radio, the whole, the whole, air, the whole uh, atmosphere is filled with remembering those who fell. The, the, uh, the whole country stands still as on Yom HaShoah, with the siren blast throughout the whole country. You see, it's not just a pocket of people doing something privately. It is a public, ex physical experience, indescribable. And just like it's hard to describe what, for example, Le Havdil, what uh, ice cream tastes like to someone who doesn't have taste buds, or what color, what, uh, what a what, a, what a, uh, a painting looks like without, for those who cannot see, it's, it, it's so difficult or almost impossible to describe the physical experience of Yom HaZikaron and Yom HaTzma'ut as well. Uh, the, the joy of Yom HaTzma'ut being in the throngs of people on Yom Yerushalayim, watching through Yerushalayim to the, to the Kotel and being crushed, literally, the physical experience of being crushed by joyous people rejoicing over the gift that we were given. It's, it's physical, it's, it's experiential, it's through and through. The saying birkata ilanot, even like the small, it's a ritual act, but saying birkata ilanot and reading all the, 
the, uh, the prophecies of having the land and having the trees and the, and the land being fertile again uh, and, and being in the land that they were talking about. Uh, seeing kids playing in the streets of Jerusalem and knowing that they're fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah that says there'll once again be kids playing in the streets of Jerusalem and old people so old that they have to use canes. And seeing that and saying, oh, these kids playing, they're fulfilling a prophecy. When I see kids playing, I see the, 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 the nevoah coming to life in my, with all, my own eyes. I have to tell you, you know, they say that, uh, the hachamim say that we were all present at Har Sinai, all the souls that will once, once again be born. Time and time again, as I walk around the mountains and valleys of where, the place where I live, I live in a pretty secluded place. When I walk around the mountains and valleys, I feel that I have my ancestors and fathers and great-grandfathers and everyone who was praying to see what I'm seeing and that they are looking through my eyes, seeing what I see. And sometimes, and you're going to think I'm crazy, but sometimes I even have the feeling that they're telling me, Raphael, go there. See that thing. We want to see that. So they're sort of directing me to see, to, to, to go into this land, to physically experience it in ways that they do through my eyes. So uh, there's being, for example, over here uh, in this country, I was here visiting at the time, but during the Gulf War, and uh, it was pretty scary, I have to say, before the lead up to the war, I was here for my brother-in-law's uh, wedding. And after the wedding, I wanted to leave. My father said, you're not leaving. I said, no, I'm leaving because you know, I, I don't want to be here during the war. We all knew the war was going to happen in 1991. He said, you know, you're not leaving. I said, but Abba. Then Michal said, well, you can leave, but I'm not leaving with the four kids. So I basically uh, the clinch and I ended up staying. And I got my gas mask and I got my things. And, the, and then the first night when the sirens, when we heard the sirens and we all had, were told to go into the sealed rooms, you know, between my father and myself, our sealed room was pretty drafty. It had like wind coming in, so it was, I don't know how, how hermetically sealed it was. But I remember saying, I'm here with Am Yisrael. My father-in-law was right. And experiencing the fact that there were just one, there were 39 scuds that, that uh, Saddam Hussein Yemach Shemo uh, shot at Israel. And living through that miracle of the limit or no damage, and you say, wow, this is unbelievable. And then on the land for the last, the end of the war, more towards the end of the war, we saw the devastation that the Scuds could do and the fatalities that happened from one Scud attack on an American base, unfortunately as it is, where 39 people were killed in one attack. We survived 39 attacks. This is, this is something that I lived through. These are things that we experience physical. The return of Am Yisrael to the land, the physical return, is the only way we can experience the true goal of Judaism, and that is the creation of a society that's responsible, responsible for everything, for everything we need to accomplish our goal as a nation, to be the model society. Uh, I'm, <clears throat> uh, I'm looking at now some questions. Please feel free to ask if you want. Uh, uh, Mara Shama, does 33 mean actions or contemplation? But can a vigil living the total, true total life also be a demonstration of ultimate ideal? Yes. Uh, Morris, every individual, by living the true total life, can be, can be an example of that ideal. Uh, but in terms of society, and it's not about private individual lives. In terms of society, of creating a nation that has to not only 
deal with it, you know, ha have social welfare, social justice, but also has to have a police force and an army and pick up the garbage and a medical system and an economic system. I mean, it's so much more, of course, every individual, and that's why I say there's a need for Jews all over the world. I, I, I don't retract that, and that's for another time to speak about that. But as a society, as a model society, when we are responsible for everything that goes on here, that's the only place where we can be the model society on the national level. Uh, so that's, the, that's how I'd like to address that, that point. Uh, A.B. Uh, right, A.B. brings up the point, A.B. Mala, is that somewhat of a contradiction of the need that we must live in Israel, as you said, as you opened the class. Uh, right, I don't believe in our time, A.B., that everyone has to live in Israel, even in our time. Uh, I believe that it's, uh, it's a matter of you know, choice, and in our time, just to tell in a nutshell, the idea that since the idea of Torah, in my view, is to become the uh, uh, goyim or or goyim, however you say it, there's a need for Jews to be all over the world, to be living examples and to speak the language and have the mindset of every country in the world. So that's why there has to be, I believe, Jews in Israel, a Jewish state, plus Jews all over the world. Amy? Um, but the examples you just gave for the last 10 minutes, 15 minutes of experiencing only things that you could live in Israel and your wife used to tell me the same thing as being able to walk down Shemuel Hanavia Street are examples that only living in Israel you can experience. So it seem, does seem as a bit of a contradiction of saying we don't need to live in there. If we, if we don't, then we don't get to enjoy those experiences to take us to that new spiritual level. That's, that's true. Uh, I, would, I would compare it though, like you ever, you ever go to a, a, a basketball game and have courtside seats? Used to. <laughs> Used to, right, right. Uh, and watching the, watching the game on television. Not you know, you, it's On television, you get a lot more information. No. You get the color commentators, and you no. get all the, you know, the replays and the angles and that. No. But when you're courtside, in the Knicks games, like I was for, for many years with my father's, uh, we had courtside tickets. And you, you, when Willis Reed was pushed off by... Uh, by Havelcheck, and the sweat <laughs> went on your face because you were so close, right? That's what, that's what, so yeah, of course you can watch the game on television, and of course you can get the experience of the game on television, and maybe even get more information. But being in the crowd, being, or even being on the court, if you will, being on the court, when you're living in Israel, you're not the spectator in every small way you're doing something to to help the country to help the that to, tonight uh this the, in my town i'm giving the dvar torah to open up the yom uh celebration which we're going to have it's going to be taped and videoed and not not everyone together but that is something that to be doing it in eretz israel in yuda is is very different than doing it from afar so that's, that's what I have to say to that. Uh, I want to thank everyone. If anyone has a question, feel free to, uh, to unmute or to, uh, to send me. Uh, let's see, there's another. Rabbi, so to fulfill the, our mission of being right into other nations, there's an individual and there's a state that has to fulfill that mission. That's correct. That's correct. We fulfill it individually in our own lives and the context of the people we have contact with by living a Torah life of integrity, of holiness, of being prime examples, what it means to be living in, with, infused with the Torah, such that people who have contact with us say, wow, that person is Jewish, that's what Torah is, that's what God is about, absolutely. The other aspect is, as a nation, as a country, as a Jewish state, be an example of a model society. 
<laughs> Listen, I'm not very close to that individually, and also the state is not close to it as a, as a state. There's a lot of work that still has to be done. A part of that work has to be with the, the courage to, to uh, develop, as we did develop the language, right? The, the Hebrew language is one example of a great miracle that the Hebrew language was out of use for many years, and there were a lot of words that were missing. And the, the, the people worked on updating the language and added new words. Like, uh, there's many, many words, I don't want to go into it now, but the word for ice cream that we all know, glida, didn't exist. You know, the, the rabbis at the time of the Talmud didn't have ice cream. They didn't need a word, they didn't need a word for ice cream. Someone had to make up that word and other words as well that were made up by people to this likewise being out of practice about running a country we have to develop new laws a new Torah as as, as Vayik Rabba says or a new covenant as Yirmiyahu says in such a way that we know how, what to do and how to do it it requires a lot of work a lot of uh, courage and it's going to be some trial and error unless we get Nevi'im, uh, Hashem, but we don't, as to, to this point, we don't see Nevi'im. As we get prophets, uh, we have to do the work ourselves. And that's, uh, but it's sure, individually, everyone in his own way is a kind of ambassador for uh, living a life of integrity, holiness, and, uh, and purity. Okay, if there are any other questions, uh, thank you everyone, and have a great rest of the day. Uh, it was great seeing you all, and, uh, and see, so it's, uh, uh, I see a lot of people here. Thank you for joining. It was really great to, uh, to, 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 to be part of this SCA uh, Day of Learning. I want, to thank, I want to thank Samantha, who's our SCA host for today, for making sure everything went well. And uh, enjoy the rest of the learning day. Good day. Thank you, Rabbi. Hope You're welcome. Bye-bye. You Thank you. That was inspirational. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. You're welcome. You're welcome. Bye, everyone.